Welcome back to Talk of the Town. I'm Steve Knox, and your host on the phone right now is State Senator Rob Sampson. Senator Sampson, how are you this morning? I am great, Steve. Glad to join you. Always a pleasure to have you. Stevie Ray Vaughan uh, intro, too. Very nice. (laughs) Yeah, I, I, I... I love that song, and it's like, I wish I could just play, like, a good minute and a half of it, but I know that, like, you're on hold, and I'm going, uh, <laughs> tough call, tough call. I would have enjoyed it. It's great, great stuff. <laughs> All right, I'll remember that for the next time, then. Um, so, Senator Sampson, you have joined in with a group of uh, uh, Connecticut business owners to file a lawsuit challenging Governor Lamont's uh, designation of businesses as non-essential. Could you tell us uh, why you became a part of this suit? Sure. Well, it's been a process, Steve, more than anything. You know, when, when the COVID, uh, you know, pandemic state of Connecticut, uh, initially I was very supportive of the governor and his efforts because he seemed genuinely focused on public health, uh, public safety, and, you know, trying to manage the situation in an appropriate way. Um, but as time has gone on, uh, his daily executive orders have become more and more distanced from <laughs> those issues and more... I think politically energized to move a uh, an agenda uh, that the Democrat Party is interested in, and not so much about the public health and safety of Connecticut citizens. Um, and you know, there's been calls by many many business owners along the way uh, for fairness in how they were treated. And there's been other lawsuits filed. Uh, you have the uh, the landlords filed a lawsuit because of the governor's rental assistance program, which I know you and I have talked about before. Um, and some other businesses types have also filed suits. You got hair salons who uh, were supposed to open one day, and then uh, because of some uh, public pressure, the governor flip flopped, making us all wonder whether or not uh, his decision making was based on medicine and science, as he claimed, or based on you know politics. And 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 which was the decision based on politics, and which one was the one based on, on medicine? Um, but the but the overarching problem since the beginning of the executive orders when it comes to the business closings was the arbitrary nature of his decision to determine some businesses as essential and some businesses as non-essential. And I believe it was done in a capricious and arbitrary way. And uh, so did these business owners who were uh, suffering and, and may not be able to reopen as a result. I was thinking about this and actually was talking with the, the mayor of Waterbury here about this last week. The the decision to allow places like, and I'm not saying that they shouldn't have been open, but I'm saying places like auto parts stores, um, uh, you know, obviously big box hard, uh, hardware stores, home repair stores, uh, Walmarts, the, the big businesses were allowed to stay open. And But again, even auto parts stores, maybe not such a big business, but why then did they close banks except for drive through I mean, if you could go inside an auto parts store, why couldn't you go inside a bank? I mean, that's where I think it became rather arbitrary. Right. Well, I mean, it depends also if you look at the types of products that some of these businesses sell. Like if I wanted to buy a lamp or a sofa or something like that, there are plenty of businesses that uh, we're used to where we'll be able to make those purchases. You know, you'd go to Bob's Discount Furniture, for instance, or, uh, you know, another furniture store to buy a sofa. But under the uh, governor's guidelines, you're limited. And essentially, you've got to go to one of the stores he has deemed essential uh, to make that purchase, which ultimately has a negative impact on the business that's closed and a positive impact on the business that's open. And that is something that our Constitution certainly um, seeks to uh, from happening. Equal protection under the law is a requirement in this country. Now, Steve, this has been a very frustrating time for me because a lot of people – believe that this lawsuit uh, is politically motivated, that, uh, you know, I'm doing this because it's a Democratic governor, uh, and that couldn't be farther from the truth. I I would do this no matter who the governor was. Uh, There is a fact that we have an obligation, and certainly the legislature and individual legislators who are a check on the executive branch have an obligation to uphold the rule of law and to speak up when they see something that's out of sync. Um, We're not looking for money in our lawsuit. Uh, we are looking for um, a correction in course, uh, simply to say, look, this can happen. Uh, I mean, a lot of it's already gone by uh, and maybe moot by the time the, the, the case is ever settled. But going forward, we want to make sure that any future uh, governor of the state recognizes what their limitations are when it comes to making decisions like that. The frustrating part on this, I think, has been, like you said, in the beginning, okay, we all kind of went off because we didn't know what we were up against. But as we started figuring things out and learning that we can do things differently and we can create 
areas and in places that were safe. But then the the entire thing was exposed, at least as far as what you're saying, as far as this arbitrary decision making, when the decision came about to open up nail salons and then and hair salons, and then that decision was rescinded within just a day or two, not for scientific reasons, which is what we were told. All of these decisions were being based on science, 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 but because he got some political pushback from people who didn't want to open. And, of course, the people who did want to open and were, were ready to open weren't calling him and going, yes, 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 let us open, because they knew they were going to open. So just hearing from one side in the argument was enough to push him back. And then saying, well, that it puts us more in alignment with Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Like, who cares? I mean, that's the kind of capricious and just arbitrary decision-making we've seen from this governor. Right. And, and you know, the, those are the types of businesses that are on the lawsuit with me. Uh, we have a hair salon for that ex- exact reason. This is somebody that was planning to open on May 20th. That's what they had been told. That's what they were expecting. They had been focused on that date and preparing for it. They jumped through all of the mountains and mountains of hoops that were put before them also, putting up plastic and, you know, uh, you know, redoing how they schedule appointments and allowing certain people in, in the building and, and moving the stations farther apart and everything else that they had to do. I don't even know all, all the details. Um, but they went through through all of that process, and just a couple of days before, I think it was on May 18th, um, you know, less than 72 hours before they're supposed to reopen, um, the governor changes his mind because of some a bunch of emails he's receiving from uh, some folks that don't want to open for whatever reason. Um, and again, you're absolutely right. That was a result of a very noisy minority um, speaking up. The decision should have been made based on medicine and science to be. Um, assuming that you believe that the governor has the power to make a determination like that. You know, it, it gets a little sticky when you start talking about businesses that um, have significant public health consequences, like restaurants or uh, a dental office or anyone where they're in close personal contact. I believe that be, we have public health requirements already, and we should maintain those public health requirements. And if they change as a result of COVID, that's legitimate too. What's not legitimate is the governor just saying, uh, without any legislative debate, without any medicine or science, without any approval, without the public health uh, coming up with regulations and having them voted on by the legislature, to just say, no, I don't think that's important. Um, that, that's, that's not the right way to run uh, businesses. And I don't mean to keep uh, talking you know, and not giving you a chance to get a word in, but another type of business that's on our, um, on our case is tattoo parlors. Uh, we have a tattoo artist that's a member of that um, lawsuit also. And I don't know if you remember, but back in mid-May, one of the um, press conferences that they held, he was asked about tattoo parlors. And the way he dismissed it, um, it, it really was shocking. He basically said, oh, no, those businesses are definitely not essential. It's, it's certainly important. And it was clear he was injecting his own personal uh, bias on what he felt was important and what is not. Not what is legitimately safe or not, or what is legitimate uh, as far as being an essential business. And this is the kind of thing we cannot have. We need to have the rule of law, and not the rule of net. The question has come up numerous times as to how much power this governor has taken upon himself because of this uh, declaration of, uh, what was the declaration of, 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 of emergency? Or I'm trying to think of the right word. I've lost yes, it. Emergency powers, the Civil Preparedness Emergency Act. Yeah, okay. That that then opened up the door for all sorts of these kind of executive orders that he was doing. And in fact, I, I read a, an article a week or so ago. He's like, he's very near the top when it comes to the issuing of executive orders. Yes. He's not done. He, he may, in fact, have issued more than any other governor in the whole country. And Extensive. People do not realize, because most of it is not publicized. It's not in the news. Uh, there are executive orders on all sorts of random things, like you know, allowing certain types of uh, home health care people who are relatives of the person they're caring for to be paid. This is a, a political agenda item the Democrats have wanted to enact for years, and they could never do it legislatively. But here it is on the color, under the color of the uh, the governor's executive order pen, and it's allowed to happen under these circumstances. And you know, whether you believe that's a good idea or not, you should recognize that we have a process for this. And we elect legislative 
uh, leaders to go ahead and vote on these things, debate them before the public, allow the public to comment before we make decisions like that. There was no necessity for the governor to enact that policy, no necessity to uh, defer rental payments. Uh, no necessity on, on so many of his executive orders if you are looking at it purely as we're in an emergency and this is a public health concern. And I've I've had people like you uh, on to talk about this, but it's been really interesting to see the silence of uh, other members of the legislature, especially people like Speaker Simowitz. He's always about, you know, what power the legislature should have and how the, the legislature is really the one that makes the laws. And yet all of a sudden, he's just been very meekly allowing the governor to just run roughshod and do whatever he wants with, with very little pushback and very little uh, speaking out about it. Right. Well, I think if it was a Republican uh, governor who was uh, enacting Republican agenda items, you might be hearing more from the speaker. <laughs> but I think that I think that's really the issue. And again, you know, I started, Steve, by talking about how this has been a process for me. I mean, this is this is not the first option that I uh, attempted uh, all along through this entire process. I have been contacting the governor's office, his covid response team and the governor directly to ask him for things. Uh, based on the concerns and requests of my constituents. And um, most of it falls on deaf ears. I, I can't say that he's, he's done everything poorly. Uh, I asked him early on in a, in a letter uh, to accommodate some of the business owners that he has forced to be closed as non-essential, um, who therefore had to lay off their employees. I asked him if he would um, make it so those folks would not be facing any increased uh, premiums for unemployment uh, compensation insurance. And he agreed to that. And I was thrilled and ecstatic. The thing is, I, I seem to remember the day that he agreed to do that was the day that he extended the business closings out like six weeks uh, when it was early on. And we had no idea whether or not um, the virus was going to be, you know, around for, for four weeks or six months or how bad it was going to be. And, and it didn't make any sense to me to, to be extending things um, for such a date so long into the future without having any real reason to do so. I heard the the governor make a comment the other day that kind of flies in the face of just this executive order that you're talking about, where he said something about how the uh, we're going to have to increase the unemployment tax, or they're going to have to put in that assessment like they had in the past to pay back the money borrowed from the state. I mean, somehow they're going to have to rebuild that fund and refill that fund. And it sounds to me like while he may have made that executive order to say that they're not going to raise the the rate due to this, they're 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 kind of backing off on that. It seems to me. Right. Well, there's a lot of pressure going on. I think that the leaders of our state and the governor in particular, uh, they want to create some political pressure to force the federal government to bail out Connecticut, despite the fact that the decisions that led to uh, our financial situation, uh, many of them existed long before COVID was ever a, uh, a word in the common vernacular. Hmm. And, uh, and the decisions that happened as, as a result of it, um, did not necessarily need to be made. So I don't know what the responsibility of the federal government and taxpayers from all across the country is to bail out Connecticut because our poor decision-making on a leadership level. Um, but that's what this is all about. It is to create that pressure. It is to to put the, um, the daily conversation, the notion that, um, you know, the feds really need to bail us out because of how bad this is. Uh, when, uh, yes, uh, it's impacted every state in some way, uh, but we've made it worse. Uh, because of the decisions that the governor has made. Has there been any discussion at all in calling a special session? I know the governor can call a special session, but can uh, can you or, or your, your constituents, uh, not your constituents, can you or your other members of the legislature, can you call a uh, special session to address this? Well, uh, so along the way, I have said all along that there's four ways to change what's happening. And, uh, you know, whether or not, um, you know, businesses should be open or closed, whether these executive orders should continue, whether the legislature should uh, override them or uh, regain control. Uh, there's only four ways out of this situation. Uh, the first one is that the governor has the power from March 9th until, I believe, midnight on September 8th, if his uh, emergency powers, which he can attempt to renew. And if he has the approval of the legislative leaders, he'll be able to go for another six months. Uh, that's number one. Uh, I don't see that happening. Uh, number two is um, legal action on a state level. Third is legal action on a federal level. And the final thing is, as you mentioned, um, the legislature being called in and regaining control. 
the governor can call us in, and he has said he wants to call us in for a very narrow set of purposes. One of them is mail-in voting, and the other one is to address the uh, what he considers the police brutality issue. Um, the alternative is for the legislature to call themselves in. But what that requires is, I believe, at least a, a majority, but possibly even a two-thirds majority, uh, to make that happen. Mm. Republicans have pledged to do so. Uh, but the problem is that the Democrats control both chambers, and you'd need at least some of them to join us. And so far, there are zero Democrats that have committed to going back into the legislative session to um, to stop the governor's continued authority under the emergency powers. Now, people might ask why you're doing this as we're moving through now into phase two, moving towards phase three. The numbers are going down. More businesses are open. Um, does that make this lawsuit a moot point? No, because, again, we're not looking for damages. This is simply to make sure that um, the rule of law is upheld and that a decision by a court uh, is issued, hopefully, siding with us. And I, I find it hard to believe that they, they could find any other way. The law is quite clear on uh, you know what the governor's authority is and the constitutionality of his actions, both on a state and federal level. We want to get that decision so that it is a precedent. So God forbid we are ever in this situation again. And you never know. I mean, there's there's conversation spike, um, you know, a return of the virus in the fall, etc. Um, I think it's good to, to make sure that this is this is fleshed out. The courts actually rule on it, and the governor knows what his limitations are. And I, I think it's interesting to see how he has been willing to even violate the Second Amendment, where he got he lost in a lawsuit on that case because he stopped people from being able to get fingerprinted for their gun permits, which, again, if you question the science behind that, there is none. I mean, what legitimately could be the problem of getting a fingerprint? But uh, that was uh, one of the executive orders that he issued that got shot down in court as a violation of the Second Amendment. The, uh, I don't know the. Yeah, I'm sorry, Steve. Um, you, go ahead. You were going to say. I, I was just going to say. I mean, that's that's a perfect example, and uh, it's not something that he was not aware of, uh, because I wrote to him on that subject when the first time I heard that there were people being denied their ability to continue with the permit process, and so did many other legislators. So it was brought to his attention day after day after day, and he simply chose not to address that concern, despite knowing that it was blatantly unconstitutional and outside the realm of his authority. And as you said, you know, pretty, pretty, um, you know, uh, a stretch to be considered a public health concern. Uh, but he did it anyway. And, uh, you know, to me, that's the reason why you got to have people willing to stand file the lawsuits. It's not politically driven. It is rule of driven. It is holding our elected officials accountable. I want people to hold me accountable to the same way. If I start doing things that are outside my, the scope of my authority, I, I want someone to say so. Uh, and that's the way I feel about the governor also. Well, it seems like the rule of law is, is something that is kind of old-fashioned for so many people these days that uh, we see what's going on around the country, and it just um, boggles my mind that this unwillingness to uh, impose the will of the rule of law, you know, it, this idea that this chaos that we're experiencing in these so many locations around the country is just acceptable is beyond, is just beyond me. Right. Well, politics has become extremely tribal. People aren't willing to do the hard work of understanding the issues thoroughly, and instead they choose a person to follow. Uh, if you look at the uh, the president, you know, people either love President Trump or they hate him, but they are not analyzing, for the most part, each decision that he makes. Uh, when I look at President Trump, I say, yes, I, I think he's great on some, some avenues. I think he's done a great job of reviving our economy, and uh, he's an American patriot. He loves this country. But I also don't like some of his other decisions that he's made. I don't think that the decision-making in the wake of uh, the, the COVID virus, as far as the, um, you know, the massive amount of government spending that was directed kind of willy-nilly, you know, we're just going to give out $600 checks. Some people don't need them at all. Other people are desperate for, for anything. Uh, who did not get them, you know, you know, decisions like that, you know, based based on an individual um, basis rather than the personality involved. And the same thing's happening on, on the, the, you know, the, the governor. And the same thing happens with our news stations. You know, if you're watching Fox News, you probably believe one thing. If you're watching CNN, you probably believe another instead of really weighing each issue individually. 
Now, I want to kind of change directions with you a little bit here because we were talking about the willingness of the governor to even violate the Second Amendment as long as he gets to impose his own uh, desired uh, rules by executive order. Um, but at the very same time, we are looking at a massive economic crisis here in the state of Connecticut. We're talking billions and billions of dollars of deficits, and for as far as the eye can see, we've got that $124 billion and growing pension liability. We have uh, businesses closing, never to reopen. Uh, we are going to be struggling for quite a while to rebuild this economy. We weren't even back where we should have been after the recession. And then to get hit by this, and this was it was even more devastating because it all happened fast. So in the face of all of that, on July 1st, we're looking at a wage increase of between three and a half to five and a half percent for state employees. And that's where the governor can, draws the line. That's where he finds his powers restricted. And I'm just stunned by that. Right. I, as am I. There is no excuse under the current circumstances for those raises. There really is not. Um, for, for many, many reasons. Uh, the first thing, as you said, is the, the governor has the power to make that decision. He has made countless other decisions that go beyond the scope of his authority. And that one, I think, actually is within the scope of his authority <laughs> uh, because he is the, the de facto boss of the state government. That's who he is. Uh, and he has really, really extreme and broad authority when it comes to state agencies and state employees on what to do. Um, and and, he, and that, that's just the way our, our, our government works. It's worth noting, by the way, that when the governor was determining which businesses are essential and non-essential, that he uh, may have decided that certain uh, state employees were not essential and had to report to work. But he did make sure that every state employee was still paid their full wages and benefits and contributions to their pension plan and everything else, all at the cost of the taxpayer. And I don't begrudge any of those folks, but it's unfair to expect uh, the private sector, which is decimated uh, for countless reasons before COVID and certainly as a result of the governor's determinations that some businesses have to be closed, to ask those people to continue to pay the same amount for a state workforce, which, you know, is extremely limited in their functions also. I mean, there's so many different things that the state agencies are not doing simply because commerce is not taking place. People are at home. Uh, there's just, you know, it's, it's a different world we live in. But they're still getting the same paycheck. Well, and there was an article by uh, uh, Kenneth Goslin in The Current this morning about UConn, where they're looking at a de budget deficit of more than $50 million. And so the president is trying to say, look, all right, let's 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 get some concessions out of the faculty and the staff and the managers here. And because the faculty and staff recognize, the union just saying, nope, we're good, thanks, have a nice day. I mean, right. to have that kind of power in the hands of a group of people who are not elected, by the citizens of the state of Connecticut who are footing the bill is just, it's, it's an insult. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> that's my <All> right. comment. <laughs> I'm, I've been giving you a bunch of long-winded answers, but that's all <laughs> I have to say to that. It's, it's, you're absolutely right. You know, it's, it's just, it's completely um, out of sync with reality. Um, you know, the government is supposed to be responsible to the people. That's our system. Um, it's sad that most people are not paying close attention to their government and, uh, you know, are, are not uh, invested enough in paying attention. Um, and it seems like, you know, something really bad has to happen before people wake up and say, you know what, we really should be watching what these guys are up to. Uh, but they've made tremendous strides while we were not watching. And uh, it's going to come to a, a head at some point. And, and the finances of this state are, are that example, and that's that's the head that we're going to get to in Connecticut. And we were going to get there with or without COVID. That's the one thing people should understand. I think the governor and the Democrats are going to try and use the virus as an excuse for our financial problems. Uh, no, uh, that is just a uh, another added layer of, uh, you know, problems. Uh, but our financial problems have began income tax, and they were exacerbated under Governor Malloy. Um, when he inherited a $3.5 billion budget deficit uh, from his predecessor back in 2011, he came to the state of Connecticut and asked for the largest tax hike in the history of our state, $4 billion, an immense amount of money, essentially a quarter of our budget. Uh, he increased them that much. And uh, what did he do? He, he didn't spend that money to pay down our deficit or to modify our budget so that we could be, um, you know, in the green the next time. He s simply spent another $4 billion, too. So we had the same exact set again two years later, and he passed the second largest tax hike in the history of our state. And it just continued. And Governor Lamont, uh, you know, I had high hopes for him in the beginning. 
but his budget that he passed in 2019 was another mountain of taxes. Uh, people know about the beverage tax and, and things, the plastic bag tax and things like that, but there are tons and tons of other hidden taxes. Um, it's oppressive in this state, and as long as that continues, it's not going to be a financial um, you know, powerhouse. We're going to continue to lag behind the rest of the country, and that's sad because the answer, uh, to, Steve, to, to our financial problems is economic growth. And the only way that happens is if we make our state uh, attractive for people to want to live here, to work here, to establish a business, uh, to retire here. Uh, instead, every policy that this government makes seems to want to chase businesses and people and retirees from here instead of attracting them. I was interviewing uh, the president of the SEIU 1199 Healthcare Workers Union last week. And he made a statement that I, in all of my years doing this and all the people that I've spoken to, I've never heard anyone ever say. And he said that that budget, that pension deficit, the $120 billion plus deficit that we're facing, that is going up, continually going up on a, and, and going up faster and faster every year. He said that everyone knows that that will be in balance in 10 years. Have you heard that? <laughs> no. <laughs> I would love to believe that. You know, some of my Republican colleagues, they take a very hard-line position. We've got to, you know, uh, tell people that they're not going to get their pensions and, you know, they've got to give them the bad news. I, I don't believe that. I believe that we can get ourselves back into uh, a state of solvency and we can make those payments. But we've got to change course immediately because every day that goes by, every bad budget that goes by makes it that much harder to bring us back into that state. Um, fearful. I'm fearful that, you know, look, there's talk about bankruptcy, all, all kinds of things. I don't want to see any of that. What I want to see is a thriving Connecticut where businesses are uh, competing with one another to get here and to sell their, their services and their goods and to create jobs and have loads and loads of people earning lots of money paying taxes in the state so we can pay off all that debt. That's what we need to do. Well, he also made another interesting uh, uh, point where he said, look, all we have to do is, look, we have all these people moving in from New York City because of this COVID-19 just tax them to death. Just tax the living hell out of them. And I'm like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> you know, if, what, if this if this is your solution to the problem, you don't have any solutions because if you're if all you're going to do is tell people who are moving into the state, hey, welcome to Connecticut. Here's your tax bill, by the way. Thanks very much for paying this as quickly as you can. They're going to turn right around and go elsewhere because they're they're proving to you in the midst of this crisis just how mobile they are and how willing they are to move. Right now, they're moving from New York to Connecticut and New Jersey because it's close. But the next step is even further away from New York City and out of Connecticut. Right. Yeah, well, progressive policies, uh, they don't work, first off. And Connecticut is a, a case in study uh, that you can look at. You know, what happens when you that has oppressive taxation? Oh, its economy lags behind the rest of the country and people move away. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> isn't, isn't that enough of an example for you to decide that you should do something different? Well, they don't think so. I mean, they don't, they don't have respect for personal property. I mean, to me, it's immoral also. I mean, to take someone else's work product really is what taxation is. I mean, we, we have to have some taxes, I suppose. We live in a world where we're not going to be able to undo our, our system that much. Um, but to take the work product of another person... Um, against their will, and essentially at gunpoint, because that's what happens. You know, if you don't pay your taxes, the IRS is going to come take you away to jail. Um, that's theft. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it's it's wrong. Um, and the, the, when it gets to be the point where it's oppressive, where people are forced from their homes, and this is a, a huge concern of mine. I mean, a lot of my district is made up of senior citizens, and they have watched their property taxes rise year after year after year to the point where they are five or even ten times what they are in some other southern states. And there's just no excuse for that. I mean, you can argue about the amount of services that are available in Connecticut versus South Carolina or something like that, but I will tell you, it's not ten times as many. Um, it's, it's just people are having to give up their homes. They bought their home in 1960 for fifteen or $18,000 or something like that, and now their tax bill is 8000 yeah. you know, It's like, how does that make sense? Well, and then you look at places like Tennessee, where it's you know has such a, 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 a an attractive tax code that they are swimming in cash and trying to figure out ways to give them the money back to the citizens of the state because they just they they have a, a major major surplus, uh, and they're because of 
good tax code and good tax policy. And it's amazing when it, whenever I hear anybody go, well, other states do this, other states do this. Well, yeah, and other states do other things. Like, let's look at states like, instead of New York State, Tennessee, you know, successful states, states that aren't looking at billions of dollars in deficits. Yeah, someone should look at what's happening in Connecticut right now to make a determination of, let's, let's analyze all of the state employees that are not working. They're getting paid, but they're, they're home. They're not actually performing the function they were hired to do in the state. I'd be curious to take a really good look at that whether it's the motor vehicles or the Department of Children and Families or whatever the, uh, the agency is that is in some sort of, uh, you know, modified or completely closed this and see how we're ticking along every day and the state is still functioning. That's an indication of whether or not we need a lot of those services and whether they actually are value for the taxes that the citizens pay. Well, that would be uh, rational, though. We can't we can't have that start here in Connecticut. That would change everything. Uh, <laughs> Sen- I think everybody already knows the answer, which is why we're not going to see any uh, real <laughs> solid reporting on that. Exactly. Well, Senator Rob Sampson, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show here. Let us know uh, the results of this lawsuit, and uh, we'll look forward to having you back on as this moves its way through the courts, all right? It's always my pleasure, and uh, thank you so much for everything you do every day, Steve. I really appreciate listening to your show and the common sense that uh, you put forward and the opportunity for people like me and others to actually get our message out in front of uh, you know our constituents so that they know where we stand. Well, thank I, you again for all you do. I thank you for all you do as well and appreciate your time as always. Have a great day, sir. Take it easy, Steve. Take care. And we'll take a break.